Hi folks, we're back again for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, we're going to be on Hebrews chapter 8 tonight, starting into it. But before we start, let's pause and let's pray together. Lord, again, as we come to your word, thank you again for your blessings and your provision for us this day. For your outpouring of love upon us. Father, you're always with us and we thank you for that. Uh, just at this time in particular, we, we really do want to feel your presence, feel that you're with us. And Lord, just remind us of that. And as we come now to look at your words, we just pray that you would still and settle our hearts of all, as always. And again, Father, as always, that you would encourage us with your word, but also challenge us with it. And just help us to draw closer to you through understanding your words and just through being able to apply it to ourselves each day. So Lord, thank you and be with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So folks, let me read for you the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 8. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honour beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There in he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifice, our high priest must make an offering too. If he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest, since there are already our priests who offer the gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of worship that is only a shadow, a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was ready, getting ready to build a tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Be sure to make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior than the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. We'll pause there for the moment. It's interesting um, that the writer of this letter comes to it and says, here is the main point. So is this what he's building up to? Is this what the writer's building up to? Again, to reinforce to us exactly who Jesus is. To highlight how futile the current system of law is or just how flawed it is. But he says, here's the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honour beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. If you think of heaven and if you think of God sitting on the throne and uh, the place of honour is at the right hand. We see this high priest sitting in the place of honour at God's right hand. And as we read through and as we understand scripture, we know that that place is reserved for God's son. So again, this is a very clear statement, declaration, whatever way you want to call it that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the perfect high priest, the one who has done so much for us um, through his sacrifice. But there's a really interesting place, that, the really interesting bit that comes up here. It says, um, there he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle or the heavenly tent, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. It starts to speak of God's creation, um, why he made things, uh, and then how they get flawed. So the Garden of Eden was meant to be like the, the, the most beautiful place on earth. And it was a place where Adam and Eve were, where um, God came and said, in the cool of the evening, to walk and to talk to them. So it's a place where God is. Um, it gets corrupted whenever there's the fall, whenever Adam and Eve sin and then are put out. And lots of people, lots of scholars would say that the tabernacle, the description of the tent, uh, looked back towards the Garden of Eden, but also looks forward to heaven. And the same with the temple and the temple plan, the temple layout. That again, the temple reflects back to the Garden of Eden, but reflecting on to um, heaven. You know, the very centre of the tabernacle, the very centre of the temple was the place where God dwelt, where his presence was. Um, God couldn't be contained in that, but it's a, it's a part of his presence, the Holy of Holies. 
And if you think even about the tabernacle, you think about the command that was given, that it be pitched in the middle of the people and that the tribes would be camped around it. You know, that, that's God's visible presence right in the very centre of, of his chosen people. And if you think of reflecting forward in the revelation, what it says about heaven, about the fact that God will be there, it's his temple, his tabernacle, that there's no need for light uh, because God's light fills it. And the gates don't have to be closed for safety because God is always there and it's always daytime. Uh, you can start to see how different things on earth point us towards heaven and point us towards God's and towards his glory. So it talks about how um, Jesus ministers in a heavenly tabernacle. Again, the priest's job was to minister within the earthly tabernacle within the earthly temple to mediate. And that's what Jesus is doing for us still in heaven. He is mediating for us uh, and he is showing God just what he has done. It says ever since high priest, and since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifice, our high priest must make an offering too. Again, pointing to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Gotta remember that whenever this letter was written, if it's written to um, Jews, then it is the writer explaining to Jews um, and to the Jewish people, the Israelites, about, again, who Jesus is. Some of them will have believed that Jesus is um, the Son of God, that he was the Messiah who had come to, to save us. Others would not have believed that. So he's trying to persuade them, um, trying to put his, across his, his side of the, the debate or the argument uh, about who Christ is. So again, that's why he keeps reinforcing about what Jesus has done. And he keeps reinforcing the fact as well, that, yeah, Jesus is not from a tribe of priests. He's not a Levite. He's from the house of David. But he is the only one who can be the perfect high priest because of what he's done. Um, he said, if, if he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest since there are really priests who offer the gifts. They serve in a system of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. So again, you see how the writer is saying, yes, we have we had the tabernacle, we have the temple, but this is only to, to try and let us grasp what heaven will be like, just to let us see and to point us towards there. Because we don't have the Garden of Eden any longer. If we had had the Garden of Eden, then we would have had that paradise here on earth before heaven as such. But we don't because of sin. It's been corrupted. It's no longer available to us. Um, God put um, a guard on the gates with a flaming sword to keep us out. So we have to look forward through what we have. And they're only a shadow. They're only a reflection or a copy of the real one in heaven. And it's really important to hear what it says, for when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Make sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. God had a very definite way he wanted it to be done. Uh, and whenever you start to read through Revelation, I know it's a, a really hard book to understand. And when it talks about heaven, it talks about it being built on the pillars of the tribes and, and, and of the, you know, how it represents and if you think even of the high priest garments how the high priest garments had precious stones and all on them to represent the, the breastplate to represent the 12 tribes of israel uh, and then reflect forward into the description of heaven and its pillars you know how it's built in the foundation of the the 12 stones um yeah you can see start to see the the, the imagery can can you you can start to see the parallels that we can draw between the earthly tabernacle and temple and the high priest garments to heaven and how heaven is laid out and how heaven is constructed in the place of God's home. And that's why it was so important for Moses to make sure he followed God's plan as precisely as he could because this was to show the people what heaven would be like, to give them a taste of glory, a 
a taste of what was to come, to excite them, to, to really enthuse them so that they'd be excited about what lies beyond. I mean, God knows how much we get connected here on earth. God knows how much we mourn one another whenever we pass away. We tend to lose sight that life here is temporary on earth, but eternal with God when we have faith and trust in God. And he really wants us to grasp that. He really wants us to get that. Uh, Because God doesn't want us to be separated from him. He wants us to be joined with him. He wants us to be able to enjoy heaven and enjoy his presence. Because that's why he made us and created us. You know, we forget that sometimes. We're made to worship God. We're made to be his handiwork. We were made in his image. Now, that doesn't mean what we physically look like. But he made us to dwell eternally with him. Because God is an eternal being. So he gave us a soul which is capable of living forever. If we trust in God. Um, you've got to remember in Revelation, and some people will agree with this, some people might disagree with this. Revelation talks about whenever uh, Christ comes back in the final judgment in Revelation 20, that there's a second death. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of scholars would believe that at that point, those who haven't trusted in God, their souls will end. You know, that will be the end of life. And that, that is the final judgment. Then they will, they will never have that presence with God. They will never be able to enjoy um, being with him. And that's what it's about. It's about enjoying his presence, about being there with him um, and seeing what he has done and what he has provided for us. It's hard to get your head around, isn't it? It's hard to imagine what that might be like. It's hard to imagine the wonder and the glory. I mean, John struggles to write it in Revelation. We really struggle to understand his imagery, to understand his timeline, to understand is it literal or is it pictorial? You know, what, what is it? All we know is it, it, it's something fantastic. Um, and, and that's what we're looking forward to. But in that place, Jesus is the one who whenever we're accused says, no, that person's covered by my blood. That person's name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, as it's called. Uh, they accepted what I had done for them and, and, and opened up their life to me. And, and even though, yes, they've done things which are wrong, and even after they accepted me, they continue to do things that were wrong. It, it, still, that their sins are covered by my, by my sacrifice. And Christ's sacrifice is the only one which is perfect. Says, but now Jesus, verse six. But now Jesus, our high priest, has given and um, has been given a ministry which is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who meditates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. Promises, God does not break his promises. God keeps his promises and keeps his word. So he's promised that if we trust him, that we will have that home with him. He's promised that he will make us a home. Jesus talked about that in John 14. Passage which we quite often reserve for um, services of thanksgiving. But a passage that we should reflect on all the time whenever we think about what Christ is promising. He's promising us an individual home in heaven. Something made just for us. That shows love and compassion and understanding that shows a, a, that personal relationship that God desires to have with us and that we can have with him whenever we trust him. You know, that in these days, whenever life seems so hard, and so tough, whenever again, yesterday in the news, you know, more word of, of people losing jobs and, and shops closing and, and you think, where is this going to end? But then remind yourself that this is temporary. What God has planned for us is eternal. And yes, there there will be suffering here on earth. Um, The writer of James doesn't say um, if problems come your way. He says when problems come your way. So expect suffering, expect hardship. 
But I also expect that when it's over, if we have trusted that we will have a glorious home and a glorious place, we will have heaven to call our home. Yeah, amazing, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. You know, we're better placed to leave it tonight than with that thought that heaven awaits us. That that is the place that's been made and designed for us to live in so that we can be with God. So yeah, in the midst of all this hardship, in the midst of heartbreak and misery and everything else that's going on, it's remembering it's temporary and what we have with God is eternal. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for all the promises of your word. Thank you again for what Jesus has done for us. And Lord, whenever we are feeling down and, and under pressure, and whenever we're feeling that everything is against us, Lord, just remind us that you are with us, that you never leave us or forsake us, and, and remind us of what awaits for us. A glorious place, made and designed not by us, but by you. Something made personally where we can live with you forever. Lord, thank you. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining in tonight. Um, trust again that during this incoming week, you know God's peace, God's presence, God's blessing. Take care and see you again next Wednesday for this. All right. Bye.